Imagine that you're a roboticist. That is to say, imagine you're engaged in one of the most audacious, even preposterous research endeavors uh, ever engaged in. So imagine that your job is to design these machines that connect sensing of the world with action in the world, and between the two, you want to put intelligence. And of course, sensing and acting are both hard, but what's really hard here is intelligence. We don't know what intelligence is. We don't have a good definition for intelligence. We can't agree on how many different kinds of intelligence there are. And yet, we're going to try to put it into a machine. So, how do you make intelligence? Well, there are lots of different approaches you could take to making intelligence. The first approach might be the hard-coded intelligence approach. In this idea, you just imagine some task that it takes people or animals' intelligence to carry out, and you write an algorithm that's going to do that. So we code up what the intelligent behavior looks like, and the machine is supposed to behave intelligently. I like to think of this as the broad jump approach to artificial intelligence. You just get up as close as you can to that line and just jump as far as you can and see how far you can get. Okay, doing this, you might be able to, uh, say, come up with good rules for a robot vacuum to vacuum your house. Or you might be able to come up with a good set of rules for a computer to play a good game of checkers. But how adaptable is this? How flexible are these algorithms to doing other things? Could you, for example, use the same algorithm for playing checkers to play chess, with some adaptations, of course? Answer is probably yes. Could you use this same algorithm to play a game of computer Go? Well, maybe, but maybe not. Could you use this same algorithm for something different like reading road signs? Probably not. That's probably a dead end. Okay, a different approach would be what we call machine learning. Now, instead of trying to write algorithms to make machines do intelligent things, we're going to try to write algorithms to make machines learn so that they can do intelligent things. So we code up the machine learning, the machine learns, and then it behaves intelligently. The idea is that doing it this way, we may get a little bit better performance out of the system. I like to think of this as taking a step back. So now, rather than just a, a broad jump, we'll take a step back and then get a little bit momentum on what we're trying to do. Um, and there's lots of ways you could do this. We could have learning from examples. So we might have a bunch of different characters. We went, might want to show this machine a lot of letter A's and say, this is what a letter A looks like. A lot of letter B's, and this is what a letter B looks like. And the idea is that it should then be able to generalize from these examples to new examples and be able to recognize these letters in new contexts. Could you use this same algorithm for doing things like recognizing chairs instead of tables? Well, maybe, um, but maybe not. Uh, maybe the three-dimensional nature of chairs and tables makes them enough different from letters that the algorithm wouldn't work. Could you use it for something as conceptually different as having robots uh, play soccer? And the answer is probably not. So if you're going to have robots play soccer, you need a different type of machine learning. So you could invent a type where they learn from experience. You would actually have the robots try out lots of different plays and see what works for them, probably in simulation to make the whole thing run more quickly. Going to this approach, could we get to the point of human brains? So with human brains, we have lots of learning certainly going on in there of lots of different types, but it's going on with very complex representations on lots of different things at the same time. We're learning about our senses. At the same time, we're learning about our actions. At the same time, we're learning about social relations and about politics and about math and about all sorts of different things. Can we code up machine learning algorithms that work for all those different and difficult things at the same time on these complex structures? Well, maybe. But maybe we should ask ourselves, how did we get these wonderful brains? 
And the answer, of course, is we got these wonderful brains the same way we got our wonderful bodies, the same way we got the diversity of life on Earth, the process of evolution. And this evolutionary process is simple but extremely powerful. In this evolutionary process, what we've got are chromosomes that define the plans for bodies, for brains, for all sorts of living organisms. And the ones that work well tend to get reproduced. You get new copies, they're crossed over, they're mutated, and we get new organisms that are similar to the previous ones, but may work even better than the previous ones. So the question is, could we have some sort of artificial evolution? So instead of trying to evolve bodies and brains, what we might want to try to evolve are artifacts. Could we, for example, use this approach to evolve antennas for microsatellites launched into orbit? And the answer is yes. Could we use this artificial evolution to evolve uh, photonic crystals that capture and manipulate light on a nanoscale? The answer, again, is yes. Could we use this artificial evolution to evolve lens systems for cameras or telescopes? And the answer, again, is yes. And not only can we make these things, but oftentimes the things that we arrive at through our artificial evolution are actually better than equivalent types of uh, devices arrived at through best engineering practices. So, imagine now that instead of trying to evolve devices, we decide we want to evolve learning rules so we can have better machine learning. The idea here is now that we would code up these evolutionary rules, the machines then would evolve learning, the machines would learn their behavior, and the machines would then behave intelligently. The idea here is hopefully we can get even farther. It's like taking another step back, getting more momentum before our leap. But there is a problem here. And the problem is that you can't eat expected value. Now, what I mean by that is the following. Imagine that you're a critter. You're just born into the world. You have to find food and shelter, protection from predators, all these things that are necessary to survive and eventually reproduce. Well, there's a couple of approaches you could take to this. The first approach would be to do essentially what your parents did and what their parents did and what their parents did and so forth back for many generations. I'm talking about instincts, right? The things that they did probably worked pretty well for them because if they didn't, they wouldn't have survived to grow up and reproduce and you wouldn't be here. So you could behave instinctively. Or you could try to learn. You could try eating different foods, for example. Does this one make you feel good? Okay, eat some more of that in the future. Does this one make you feel bad? Okay, probably eat less of that in the future. Does this one kill you? Eat a lot less of that one <laughs> in the future. Okay, so there is this problem, which is that through learning, you might eventually be able to find out a better way of doing things in the world than your ancestors did, but you've got this dangerous and difficult period where you have to learn, and while you're learning, you're using energy, and you're taking a lot of risks and a lot of time. So how do you get past that initial barrier to make learning worthwhile? Well, there are lots of possibilities here, but one is to go back to the question that I posed. I posed this question and said, imagine you are this critter in the world and that you have to find food and shelter and protection from predators and so on. What if you don't have to do those things? What if somebody else is doing them for you? What if, in short, you are being nurtured? Let's say your parent is providing you with food and shelter and protection during that early period of your life as you're learning what is safe and what is unsafe, what is beneficial and what is detrimental. So we think nurturing actually promotes the evolution of learning. It gets you through that difficult part of your early life so that you can then go on to achieve better things down the road. So stacking up the evolution of nurturing and learning next to these others, 
Again, we're hoping to get greater progress. Again, taking yet another step back so that we're running more quickly when we hit that line. But wait, there's more. Because once you have the capability for learning, what can you learn? Well, one of the things you can obviously learn is what foods are good for you, shelter, those things that we talked about. Self-care, right? You can learn how to get more resources for yourself. But once you have more resources for yourself, what can you do with them? Perhaps you could invest them in your offspring. Perhaps you could do more nurturing now that you have learning. In fact, you might even learn directly how to be a better nurturer. What works well for your children? So once we have learning, we might be able to get more nurturing. So we've got a virtuous cycle, like the virtuous cycle we saw this morning. We've got a new virtuous cycle here where more learning results in more nurturing, more nurturing results in more learning. And once we get this cycle going, we can develop or evolve creatures that have tremendous learning and nurturing abilities. Think, for example, in the biological world. There are lots of organisms that have very little or no nurturing and very little or no, nur or, and no learning. But there are also organisms like people who have a tremendous learning capability, but also do a tremendous amount of nurturing, right? We might take 20 years nurturing our children before we're ready to let them go out and explore the world on their own. That sort of virtuous cycle is what we believe has led to the tremendous learning and nurturing capabilities of people, and we would like to see that sort of same sort of thing in robots. So now that they have the ability to learn, that intelligent behavior that they might exhibit is greater nurturing. And if that's what they uh, uh, exhibit, we might then evolve more learning and then more uh, nurturing, and then it'll keep going and going and going. So right now we're not just taking a run at this and leaping off into space. We're going to hit the ground running and we're going to keep going. That's the idea behind what we're looking at here. So if we've got this evolution of nurturing and learning, what does it look like in robots? Well, here's a simple example. Imagine you've got this room and it's got a light in it. And the task that this robot is supposed to do is simply go under the light, use its uh, photoreceptors, and gain energy from that light. But there's a hitch. And the hitch is a switch. And the switch needs to be turned on before the robot can go under the light and collect this energy. Well, the robot should be capable of doing this, but it does add extra burden to the robot to have to turn on the switch at one end of the room and sit under the light at the other end of the room. What if instead we put two robots in there, and one robot is related to the other robot as a parent to a child? That is to say, the chromosome that defines the behavior of the child was derived from the chromosome that defines the behavior of the adult, of the parent. What we have found is that doing this, the parent will evolve the behavior of turning on the switch for the child as a way to propagate its genes, that chromosome-defining behavior, into the next generation. And then the child can receive more energy by spending more time under the light and less time driving around the room turning on switches. Our next step, the one that we're involved in right now, is actually having the, the child do something more complicated. That the child now, instead of having a single light, has multiple lights to choose from. And the lights have different power levels and different reliability levels. And so uh, the child has to figure out which of these lights to go to. And moreover, the values of these lights change during the lifetime of the individual. So it can't just act instinctively to find the best one. It has to learn during the course of its life which one is currently the best one. Go there. We can also flip this and have multiple switches. And now the parent needs to learn during its lifetime how to uh, nurture better, how to choose the switch that most benefits the child. We're also looking at having multiple lights and multiple switches so that both need to learn at the same time. And what we expect to see here is the parent will evolve nurturing to turn on switches. The child will learn which light is the best 
and then the parent will learn which switch is the best for that particular child. We can even imagine going much further where we've got many switches and many lights and halls and passages and the robots have to turn and have to remember which way they turned the last time they went. Harder and harder situations, but all the time evolving learning and nurturing. Of course, that's only one type of nurturing, direct helping. There could be other types of nurturing that we evolve as well. Providing safety, right? Making sure the robot doesn't fall down the stairs as it's learning or drive out into traffic. Teaching, directly telling the other individual what should happen in a particular situation. Other types of learning we expect to be evolved as well. Learning from observation, seeing what the other robot does. Learning from instruction, actually being able to take that direct teaching that the parent robot is providing to it. Beyond that, we expect to them to be able to have to communicate in order to coordinate their actions and to be able to teach and to learn. So we're expecting to see the evolution of learning and language and communication and nurturing all in one package. And there's another thing yet that they might uh, need to evolve. If one's going to nurture the other, it helps that the one who is doing the nurturing can understand the needs of the one who is being nurtured, understanding what its state is, understanding where it's trying to get to. In short, what we expect to evolve here is empathy in our robots. So there it is, the evolution of nurturing and learning in robots, uh, an audacious approach to an audacious research endeavor.